Hi there, and we are live once again. First off, I want to thank, thank Stephanie Crawford there for saying, uh, for actually tweeting out that she thought my channel deserved more subscribers and views, and I really do appreciate that. So when I hear stuff like that, it, it kind of makes my day, so thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, if you haven't checked out her writing, make sure that you check out at Stephanie Crawford. Go to her Twitter account. Also check Screencast and Just This Podcast, both of which she's on. She actually has a lot of podcasts now. She's kind of become a podcast superstar. So uh, Brian is off down here as well, who does Just This and Pure Cinema. Him and Stephanie work together a lot, and they make a perfect dynamic duel. So anyway, tonight we are talking about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Not just the first one. No, we're going to deep dive into all the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films. And I, I, I got some pretty controversial... Um, thoughts on uh, on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. I have been asked to do this video for a while now and I have promised it and today just seemed like the perfect day to do it. Now you're going to notice that my video is earlier than my normal videos are. That is actually kind of on purpose. Uh, one of the reasons behind that basically is because some of my shifts, my work shifts are going to be kind of earlier in the uh, in the next couple of weeks. So you're going to get some earlier videos. Hopefully that's going to be able to, for more people, to actually dive in and, uh, and see and, and get into the videos. Now, uh, so hopefully we'll get some of the movie, channel, movie club here. Uh, if you guys have not been here before, welcome. My name is Aaron. Uh, we're, this is a completely interactive medium, so feel free to talk and comment as much as you want, not just with me, but with anybody else in the club as well. Uh, that's kind of how this works. <clears throat> but I wanted to talk Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre was probably, yeah, probably the first horror movie that I ever saw uh, at a very, very young age. So uh, if you've, uh, and I mean like, we're talking pre-6, when I originally saw the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, obviously I could not comprehend what I was watching at the time. I just know that it freaked me out. Years later in video stores, I would see uh, that, uh, that VHS cover with, uh, with Gunnar Hansen and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre outfit, like carrying the chainsaw. Hey, Corey, how's it going, man? Welcome. <clears throat> I'm actually doing an early video tonight. Uh, we're talking Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and I have some views on the, <clears throat> on the series. I'm going to go through the entire series. I'm going to show my complete collection of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So you get to see that as well. <clears throat> and I got some neat little additions. And I partially want to go in the order that I like them, but I kind of want to, th I think maybe for, to make it a bit easier on everybody, I'll, I'll go in the films one at a time. Now, <clears throat> it was actually a long time before I got an actual edition of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I kept waiting for the right edition to come out. I, I wanted, this, this was kind of like a, a big deal for me to, uh, to get this movie because it, it meant so much to, uh, to my life. Texas Chainsaw Massacre was made in 1973, came out in 1974, and it uh, kind of changed in a way that, that, a, that a lot of movies were done. Uh, Way, way pre-Blair Witch Project, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was a film that kind of marketed itself as like kind of based on a true story and was extremely popular with that. It's also known as being an extremely bloody, over-the-top, gory type of film. It's not that at all, though. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre actually has very little gore. and It's very cleverly done and leaves a lot to the imagination. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre does use set dressings and the great Bob Burns to uh, to make you think that your the movie is much more bloody and grimier and dirtier than it actually is. The basic plot line, which I don't really need to get into too much, is some guys in a van, they're traveling out, they take a wrong turn, and they become interlopers in the worst possible place. The, uh, they meet up with, the, uh, with Leatherface and his family and the Hitchhiker played masterfully by Ed O'Neill. Uh, so this is my original. Hey, Uncle, welcome. This is my this is my edition of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This is the, uh, you know, commonly known as the Black Maria edition. It is early for me. I thought I'd do an earlier video to see if, you know, some people 
when I'm coming in here, they're often going to bed or uh, they're, they're doing some other stuff at the time. So I, I wanted to give uh, some people that usually come in at the end of the video <clears throat> kind of a, a chance to actually see this. So I'll go over this one really quickly and then I'm, I'll tell you my, my thoughts on the actual film, which is going to be pretty, pretty simple and not controversial at all actually for this one. Hey, <laughs> not that <laughs> I'm talking about the hitchhiker. I love it, Neil. So here we go. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This is the special edition that came out in uh, Black Mirror. This has like uh, bonus discs. Uh, there's uh, four commentaries. There's, of course, the shocking truth. There's a, d a disc here, an exclusive bonus disc that's exclusive to this set. And it has like a, a conversation between William Friedkin and, uh, and Toby Hooper, which I really enjoy. It has a poster on the inside of it as well. And of course, you cannot forget the, uh, the blood soaked apron, which I'm a huge, huge fan of. So it's not, when it comes to part one, it, it's pretty simple. <clears throat> it's, it's a classic. I don't think anybody is gonna say that part one, that part one is like overrated or anything like, no, part one is a classic when it comes to the horror genre and it, it's deservedly so. It's masterfully directed and acted. Marilyn Burns does a great job in that. Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. And, uh, she just really makes the film. This isn't, won't be Marilyn Burns only appearance in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films, though it will be one of her only appearances as that character that she's playing in this film right here. Uh, actually, Corey, my better half got me that set one year as a surprise. So uh, it's one of those things I didn't know I was getting. It was a Christmas gift I didn't know I was getting. And when I opened it up, I was like, yeah, I was, I was, I was blown away. Uh, now, after this, this was really dark and gritty and grimy. And... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine, and you can imagine that it even smelled worse that, you know, they put all the bones and all that stuff in there as well. That couldn't have been a really good smell because uh, they did, like, do the place up to make it look extra grimy and extra dirty. It's just, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is pretty much as close to a perfect horror film as, as you're going to get, in my opinion. It's, it's one of the perfect horror films. It just does the the genre so well and in a way it kind of helps create i'm sure there's more done before this but it helps like cement the kind of the the backwoods massacre type genre like which you would see go on in so many other films and be masterfully lampooned in dale and tucker um but uh this one here i i, I can't say anything at all bad about now the thing was that tobe hooper had a insanely dark sense of humor so what a lot of people didn't get and it actually bothered him about the film is that uh the film uses a lot of dark humor that people don't pick up on they actually take it more seriously than he uh than than he intended what does that mean well uh it means that when he got a chance to make a sequel when he decided that he was going to do a second chainsaw, he couldn't out gore or out scare or out like grunge the one that he originally did. So he was gonna go farther into the dark humor aspect of the character. Hey Isaac, how's it going, man? Um, he was gonna go over the top. And uh, he kinda did. Now this is the Arrow edition. There was a Scream Factory edition as well of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which I, I really, really love. T is actually really good for the vocal cords. Thank God I need it because I'm going to be going back to work tomorrow. And i got to show this because it's actually kind of a cool one. So we have the leather face himself. Now, this one I really like because I'm a really big fan of Carolyn Williams. Uh, exactly, with Gremlins 2. Just, just go, go overboard. This here, of course, like, just to, like to hit like the humor home, 
This, of course, is them doing the pose from the Breakfast Club. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. My better half's uh, father, uh, he went and saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 in the theater back in the day, back when it came out, right? <clears throat> and he, he liked horror. He stopped watching horror films after that because that movie disgusted him. It was so gory and over the top. I think if he went back and watched it now, he'd, he'd get like a, a big... A big surprise at actually how the how it's uh, how it's done. So let's take out the other stuff right here, and then I'll talk about the film itself. Hey, fat man, is Jake around? Hopefully, you get that joke. <laughs> Being disappointed now you and now you love it. Well, that's kind of what I'm going to get into actually. There's Chop Top, the character Bill Mosley, who makes the film for me, along with Carolyn Williams and those. Oh, so sexy long legs uh, <laughs> that she has. Uh, hey, Scalder. Uh, yes, Carol Williams, definitely on the Google Doc list. Now, that's not, she appears actually at the beginning of part three as well. So, if you're eagle eyed viewers to watch part three of Texas Handsome Massacre, we'll see Carolyn Williams there at the beginning of the film. And there's a great book here as well. I wanted to see if we can get like a. This one here included like early films from. Uh, Did she j actually jump out of the one the original massacre? Probably. You have to understand, it was a very, very low budget film. So a lot of the people ended up doing their own special, own, own stunts and effects within that film. Uh, like to put it to the to the point, remember the sequence where uh, where Ed Neal, as the hitchhiker, when he at, where he's on the uh, when he falls down dead, on the uh, kind of like falls down on the asphalt on the pavement uh, at the at the end of the film. Well, it was extremely hot. Uh, during that period of time, he actually burnt himself uh, pretty badly, actually, uh, from from that sequence in the film. There was a lot of unintentional accidents and uh, things that happened during uh, the, during the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I really strongly recommend checking out the documentary. It's really really good. Uh, the guy John Dugan that played the the grandfather in the in the first film, he was actually only 30 years old at the time. He was under a bunch of uh, of makeup obviously <clears throat> and uh, did you know a great job for for everything that he had to do so when they get to part two uh, much like was just mentioned there I didn't like part two when I saw it first I actually hated part two Texas Chainsaw Massacre for me was was, was perfect it, it scared me it got me in all the right places uh, part two didn't it wouldn't be till actually a few years later uh, not like an, a second viewing but a few years later that I actually would like part two uh, that I actually kind of got what it was going for I got the I got the twisted humor of it I uh, I uh, the only thing at the time Carolyn Williams was the only thing I liked about part two um, and I liked uh, Bill Mosley I just his character was so over the top I just really like him as an actor um, Chop Top Unfortunately, it's a character that the that you know they can't bring back. Uh, oh yeah, there are some. Uh, there are a lot of comedic parts. It's there's some Isaac that people don't even like. I think they don't pick up up on. Um, and uh, that's why he went so overboard with 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 the second one. And he does a great job. And when I rewatched this movie um, years later, I really kind of fell in love with it. It's one that uh, it became like a kind of one of a personal kind of not my favorite. But that's always going to be part one. Um, but one that I actually grew to enjoy a lot more. Now, one of these movies here I'm, that I'm going to talk about, I, I really, really grew to enjoy a lot. But next up, let's talk about the Jeff Burr one. Uh, Jeff Burr, who I did, who did like uh, From Whisper to a Scream, and oh God, he did. Jeff Burr's done a lot of films anyway. Um, was asked to make Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 3. Well, he kind of gets killed. <laughs> uh, but that's not the reason, really. The real reason is because Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 was done by a different company and that owned the rights to him. That's why you've never seen him come back in, in any of the prequel ones as well. Uh, they, don't have the, they don't have the rights to, uh, to chop top for, a, for, a checks, for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's why, hey, ain't got time to play. Uh, welcome back. <laughs> 
so that they can't they actually can't use them it's a shame because bill mosley when they did them when they did texas chainsaw later on in the 3d one which i'll talk about in a little bit uh bill mosley of course is in that he they originally had wanted him to play the character of uh of chop top but he couldn't do it because there was rights issues so they had him take over uh ed sato's character uh jim sorry jim sato's character of the of the, of the chef the cook and uh in the first film I need to see. Next up is Pirate 3. And as somebody just mentioned, Pirate 3 had a, had a kick-ass promotional campaign. <clears throat> Chop the top standalone movie. That must have been like some something done kind of like but a concept. That would have been cool. I would have liked that. Um, if I was doing a Chop Top standalone movie, I, I'd go darker with it. And I definitely would go into kind of the PTSD angle of it as well. Uh, because that you know that aspect is there and, and i think would have been really well to uh to something to like kind of dive into so part three is fun uh we got ken foray uh in this one here and who is the the lead in this one kate hodge right yeah kate hodge and beagle mortensen of course as the as the hitchhiker for this film here how do i feel i actually really love part three is there, yeah, there's live stream day town and you're here right so part three rocks uh uh yo andy uh, it's a lot of fun jeff bird does a great job directing it the unrated version is is the better version of the film they have uh one of the neat little throwbacks throw into this is well ari mailhoff plays the role of uh of leatherface <laughs> but uh What's really cool is that the girl in this one, there's a little girl character, like this creepy little girl character. And if you're a fan of the Friday the 13th franchise, then you know that the little girl in, uh, in this one here, not always uh, Torture Vision. Have you ever seen Rob Zombie's Halloween? Uh, the theatrical version of that is much better than the, than the director's cut. Unneeded rape sequence. <laughs> um, so the little girl in this one here, Uh, I'm, I'm getting that one, Dakotan, actually. Uh, well, he does dress... He dresses as a female in the first one. Yeah, like, uh, he does have, like, that... The he, he does have those, you know, those masks. The more feminine. Like, it, it is... Leatherface has a lot of different, like, masks. He doesn't have a personality. He's not supposed to. Uh, he, he's, the, he's, the, he's the child of the, of, of the character. Uh, he's, he's a child of the family, right? He's, 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 he's the little boy. He's, he's the abused kid. That's what Leatherface is. Uh, everybody else... Uh, has has personalities and over the top personalities, kind of to really to make up for leather. Leatherface is not the monster of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series that a lot of people would like to uh, kind of to make him out to be. And I think this is one of the reasons that some of the latter films kind of got it wrong. Um, he's the, you know, he's actually the gentle giant of them all. Like it's. <laughs> they are definitely the gentlest of the of the characters uh the the hitchhiker character is usually the one that uh that that's actually kind of like the more over the top kind of creepy character the other family uh they, they speak leatherface usually he's getting hit he's getting he's, he's getting abused uh, they did a prequel to the remake which i will get to we'll get to those after <laughs> but uh this one here is a lot of fun I love the Saz family, and just like Uncle right there, I do enjoy Part 3 more than I enjoy Part 2. I think Part 2 is a good film. I think it's a fun film to watch, but I think Part 3 is a better film, and it flows more with the aesthetic of what I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre should be, um, in, you know, in my not-so-humble opinion. I love the whole Saz family thing. I love the, the way this is done. I like the, the chainsaw fights. Uh, this Viggo Mortensen does an amazing job, but now I want to get into one that just recently came out, and I really want to talk about this one. The romance, yeah, there, that's the thing. You go back to any of the Texas Chainsaw, even the creepiest one, and watch watch Leatherface uh, in the uh, and see how you know how much he's kind of like the he's kind of the pop on character. He's he has the scary monstrous scenes in part one, like 
Gunnar Hansen does an amazing job. Gunnar Hansen himself is a little is was a big teddy bear. Uh, when I got to meet him, I was obviously scared. I'm gonna go go meet Leatherface, and uh, oh, very early role for Viggo Mortensen. He was in prison as well, by the way, actually in uh, in '86, I think. Um, also, a really cool movie. But the one that I really wanted to talk about tonight, the whole brought this whole thing on. This one right here. This is Texas Chainsaw Massacre: of The Gen Next Generation. Now this is written by the person that co-wrote the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre film, Kim Henkel. Uh, and I got a lot to say on this one. Oh, in the movie prison. Uh, he was in the movie prison. Actually, so is uh, Kane Hodder, actually. So what are your thoughts on this one? Uncle just said, bad movie, great actors. Uh, he, he was extreme. So I, I had the same experience with him. I, th I thought that that uh, Gunner was like one of the nicest guys that I met. Very soft-spoken. Uh, he was very proud of the Texas Chainsaw 3D uh, film that was coming at the time. I actually was very... Very like uh, I actually fought people <laughs> online about Texas Massacre, Texas Chainsaw because I uh, be, be, I his love of the film uh, I went in like with serious, serious amount of love for this film. So this is Texas Chainsaw Massacre: The Next Generation. Um, for the longest time, if you wanted to get an unrated copy, this you had to go to Canada uh, and get this one right here from Lionsgate. It's one of the original covers for Texas Chainsaw Massacre three D. There you go. There's a couple. Posters for Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3D. This is the original. Sorry, the next generation. So, this is normally considered the fun, over the top. Yeah, and I, they, sh well, actually, Renee Zellweger, not so much. She actually makes fun. She, she laughs about it. But Matthew McConaughey, or at least his, is the person that, like, that handles his stuff, the, is Matthew McConaughey's handler. Uh, his agent like fought hard to get that movie stopped. That's true. We all horror fans get their aggressions out on, on screen, so we don't need to be really aggressive elsewhere. So, this is the over-the-top funny Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie that people like praise for it, its humor, and it and it's kind of silly, over-the-topness, and it it's really great at doing that. This does it better. This does it 100% better. Uh, the humor in this one I'm not, is better than the humor in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'm going to say that right now. It does the humor so much better. And the fact is that it does have some really great actors. Oh, it is definitely intentionally over the top. This was a movie, this was one of the original posters for Texas Chainsaw Massacre the Next Generation. It's pretty much you see the Renee Zellweger character with chainsaw lipstick. Or if you maybe the the Leatherface character. Now it is no like thing, no accident that the person that played Leatherface, well he's unfortunately passed away right now, but uh was uh Well, I, I don't think he was, he was, he was, a, he was he, you know, I think that the actor himself was, uh, could, could do the, the feminine aspects of Leatherface really well. This is probably one of my favorite later portrayals of the character Leatherface, and I'm going to get into why. Because what I'm about to say right now, a lot of people aren't going to agree with, so I really want to explain it well. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre of the Next Generation in its uncut uh, glory uh, if you want to put it like that, actually, it's not—it's never been really uncut. This is about as uncut as you're going to get. Uh, but it's—it's it's fun. It not only is it a fun movie, it's—it's it's a funny movie. And the uh, the performances are spot on. You've got this really like annoying, obnoxious character um, that. Uh, and I've, I've known guys like this, that basically he's, he's cheating on his girlfriend, he gets caught, 
so he, he comes up, you know, you know, I got to. He said, you know, because you're not want to have sex with me. And if I don't have sex, Kim Henkel directed actually. The I directed the uh, the director that wrote the, the the first film. So he wrote the first film with uh, with uh, with Tove Hooper. So we're not talking about like somebody coming in that doesn't know the vision of the of the series. This guy, I know this guy worked on the first one. Um, he's you know he's he's got a strong vision of what he wants to do with the series. Now there are certain aspects of people that don't like. They don't like the ending of it. They don't like they don't like the the way that that Leatherface is portrayed because he 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 goes more into the feminine aspect of, of Leatherface. But Leatherface, that's the thing. Leatherface isn't a person where with a personality, isn't a person with with a set in stone type of persona. People get that wrong all the time. And the actor, unfortunately, I think it's, I think it's Robert Jacks. Uh, Robert? Is it Robert Jacks? Somebody Jacks, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Robert Jacks. So he passed away, unfortunately, at the age of 41. Uh, the actor that played Leatherface in this film. He, uh, he, he does, he gets the aspect of like, kind of like, he tries to be like the, the female and kind of like the mom, sister type character in, in certain parts of the film. Uh, yeah, it's, it's supposed to be an ambiguous symbol. That, that, you can put whatever fear or mask or face you want to put on. Think of the the Michael Myers mask, uh, where it, it where it's just kind of blank. A leather face is literally the Michael Myers mask inside a note. He he's, he's a blank slate, and he's supposed to be a blank slate. Um, there's an ambiguity too. Uh, leather face. There's li like as part two got into like the kind of like the the puberty aspect of leather face and having leather face kind of fall for uh, for for uh, for legs for you know stretch for uh, for Kellen Williams character and uh, we see you know Leatherface got a girlfriend type of thing as as fun an aspect as that is with the with the film itself uh, Leatherface as a character uh, may not have like well in my opinion may not have gone may not have gone that way or may not have even gone anyway like if you really wanted to think about him like sexually at all it was you know he was the face that he wore uh, he was the little, the one. He was the he was the abused member of the family. This film does so much, so well. Uh, every actor in this movie for me is spot on. They do an amazing job in uh, in this film. Uh, the guy that plays the dickish character that was one of, if not his first role that he that he'd ever done, and he he's so like kind of like unlikable but likable at the same time. If you know what I mean. If you if you've seen this movie. Um, and, and he's always, he's always some kind of like snippy remark that he's to his girlfriend, to everybody. It doesn't matter. He's being, he's, there's, he's got a gun to him. He's got like somebody with, that has a rifle to him and he still can't stop being a dick. He, he, he can't. There's no way that he can stop it. Renee Zellweger is really good in this film. Uh, this as the, the most kick-ass like character, female lead of, for all of the films. Renee Zellweger kicks ass in this movie. Uh, there are some really good, like there's some really good, like stunt work and sequences within this film. She does this, uh, this kind of like this zip line aspect of, in there when she comes out. Like she, she really goes all out. There's a part where she, j she just, she can't take it anymore. She's like, screw all you guys. Leatherface gets up and screams, and she's like, you sit the fuck down. <laughs> and it is an awesome, awesome scene. Um, no, if if you've never seen this one in a while, definitely rewatch it. Uh, understand going in, it is meant to be a comedy. It is meant to be humorous. Uh, the humor is not unintentional in this film. The humor is completely intentional and was meant that way. Henkel was making a smarter, more kind of like tongue-in-cheek film or tongue-through-cheek than uh, a, yeah, even the most. These would still be fairly low budget. Uh, because that, you know, honestly, these, you know, everybody in this movie at the time that it was made, even though they became bigger actors afterwards, they were all like unknowns, uh, at the, at that time. None of the actors here were like, were well-known actors. Uh, Matthew McConaughey, this is one of the, you know, one of the early things that he did. And he, he kills it in this film, by the way. You can see what a good actor Matthew McConaughey is, is going to become, uh, right from this film. And... I would say that if I ever met Matthew McConaughey, I, I, I'd say, you know, don't be ashamed of the role you did in this movie because anybody can take 
a really frigging great script and and if the script is good enough and it's Oscar baited enough yeah well good job you did those really good really well written lines and uh, and 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 he made it a good movie uh, that's great that movie might have been good no matter who did it but this movie is good uh, and Matthew McConaughey's, role, Matthew McConaughey's role is good because he did it and he does this very well um, one thing to look for in the character of Matthew McConaughey is is that his character is not as one-dimensional as Viggo Mortensen or even as Ed Neal is uh, Ed Neal is pretty much kind of a uh, Actually, it was, uh, I think Days and Confused came out maybe after this. Um, like he was, Makani was not a name at this time. He was he, he was literally nobody, and uh, he became like big. Like just uh, I think Days and Confused got got released right after this, and that's one of the reasons that this thing got like shelved for so long. You have to remember this movie was shelved for a long time. So. What's really super cool about this film, what's super cool about Matthew McConaughey's role is that it's it's a layered role. It, he could just be the over-the-top crazy guy uh, that, you know, like Ed Neal. He could be the uh, the charming, good-looking, crazy guy of uh, that Viggo Mortensen played. But it, it's a, he's a little bit more sadistic. It's a little bit deeper than that. He's a little bit more tortured. And you see that when uh, when the Illuminati comes into it. We You kind of see him... Oh, this movie came, was... Zapo was it says 1994. Uh, I'm sure this was made before 1994. It just came out like years later. Years later. So this movie only was ever released probably because of movies like Days of Confused and uh, and Bridget Jones Diary. No, not at all. Actually, this film got a very short re short theater release. Uh, wouldn't have got anything. I don't even know if it got a theater. If it got a theater release at all, uh, I know that I remember it got shoved on video. Uh, this movie was shelved for a, for a while. This, they were, you know, this would would not have gotten put out if the stars were not actually hadn't gotten big because they weren't like uh, they weren't well, uh, they didn't like it. But there's a sequence in this where Matthew McConaughey uh, he meets up with the with the Illuminati character, who tells him that you're not going to be a silly boy, are you? I'd hate to think that you're going to be a silly boy for me. Which is one of my favorite lines in that film, um, and he's like so over the top, and he's so McConaughey's character is so is is so aggressive, and so like you know I I'm the leader, like the, this is my household, I I control this, I I control the fear, I control the power. Hey, Polly, uh, and you see him like re rein it in because this guy scares him. But he can't show anybody else around him that uh, that he's controlled or he's scared, uh, and so in that in that one sequence in the film, and you can see McConaughey doing all that in, in like in, in like in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre: Next Generation, in, in in a very low budget horror film, you can see him do all that, and you can see it in his face, you can see it in his actions in that one sequence within this film. Uh, it, it was you know the it, this movie was sabotaged when it came out. You have to understand that the agents of Rene, this Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey sabotaged this film. Uh, definitely check out this movie. Way way better. It, it could be it could be me. Uh, we've had some like iffy weather here. So there you go. That's my. I don't know what to do, but it's so far still going. If I freeze up, I apologize. <laughs> but my internet's been pretty good lately, so. So I don't know whether I should keep going or not. I want to keep going, but if I'm glitching out on your side, I, uh, I kind of don't want to keep going. But definitely check out this one right here. Now, after this movie, uh, it would be a while before we'd see a new Texas Chainsaw Massacre film come out. Actually, we wouldn't. Uh, they'd reboot the series. They'd reboot the, the franchise. That's when we would get another Texas Chainsaw Massacre. 
And uh, I, I think it's time that, uh, that we talk about it. Platinum Dunes, <laughs> yeah, they just were the, were the rear villains for that one, Torture, uh, decided that they were going to get into the remake game. Michael Bay is known for Transformers and doing things over the top. Super over the top. So, you got Marcus Nespo, who worked on uh, music videos. No, it, uh, it really shouldn't. <laughs> Hopefully the internet is better now. Uh, I know it is for some other people. I've got a cat like kind of going up there, uh, but okay. Anyway, <laughs> this all this internet talk distracted me. Uh, anyway, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. I. Uh, I really don't like this movie uh, at all. I, I've tried several times. I mean, the first time I saw this movie, I thought, you know, for a remake of a Texas Chainsaw, that's that's it's pretty good. And then I rewatched it. And if any movie ever falls apart on rewatching, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the remake, really does fall apart. Uh, aside from having a guy that's apparently, from what I've heard, a real dick in real life playing the uh, the, the character of, uh, of Leatherface. I, I do like Jessica Biel. I think that the cast is very CW attractiveness looking. Uh, that's, you know, that's not really a dig at it. That's what they're going for at the time. But uh, they give like a story behind, Leather they give like Leatherface a, uh, like a skin disease. Um, which makes no sense, and you know, just to say this is the reason. Oh, now my now it's gone, and of course it's gone at a uh, at at a at a really kind of like iffy aspect of it. Does anybody here know the great Irly Army is the only good thing about this film, and uh, and the cuteness of uh, of Jessica Biel? So because I look like Mr. Magoo. So if I've frozen up on your side, I've frozen up on my side too. I don't know if you guys can hear me or not, um, but this has turned into a podcast, and, and I'm very disappointed. Uh, I hate this film. I, 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 I truly do, because it gets everything wrong about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, if Arlie Ermey wasn't in this film, I don't think half the people that, that do like the film or say they like the film would actually like the film. Um, it truly gets the the remake aspect. It's it's it gets the remake. No, no, this is the, not the beginning. This is actually this is the remake. It gets everything wrong. It gets the family aspect of it wrong. It gets the character of Leatherface wrong. The pacing is uh, is horrible in uh, in this movie, and it does the the thing that remakes and horror movies are accused of doing that that don't often do uh, that they don't really often do, but they're often accused of doing doing, and that is the uh, this movie depends on making stupid decisions it depends on the characters making the dumbest possible decision possible like like the dumbest possible decision um like i changed the podcast oh, so <laughs> we're gonna go with this hopefully it'll come back if not hopefully you guys will stay and actually listen to it because hopefully yeah sound is good there we go <laughs> um even though this is the worst possible picture this movie Depends. Every scene in this film depends on them making the dumbest decision possible. Somebody got in, in their car. Somebody blew their brains out because she had a um, a gun 
somehow hidden inside of her. Not quite sure how that works, but uh, but it, it but it does. Uh, then they decide to wait with the body. Uh, when the sheriff doesn't show up and gets them to go to like a a very sketchy area, everybody else decides, you know, we should leave. She de- just. <laughs> Jessica Beale's character decides, uh, no, we should totally stay here with this dead body because, you know, um, she's the reason that every one of them dies. Uh, she throws away the keys because she can't find her boyfriend. Um, even the ending, ending of the film, I mean, I just could watch Full Metal Jacket say it, of course. <laughs> yes, I could be. I could be pantsless right now, you guys would know it. <sighs> Leatherface's childhood don't don't get me into <laughs> how horribly they did the mess up his childhood aspect in, the, in there. Even the end of the film, when it, when it's supposed to be really suspenseful, because the guy is coming back to the to the truck, and uh, the, and you're thinking, oh no, they're they're gonna she's she's gonna get caught because she's totally in that truck. But she's not in that truck. She can't be in the truck. You know she's not in that truck because of the way it goes down. Because I hate it. <laughs> I recently saw this in a, in a drive-in theater right along as a double feature with the original Friday the 13th uh, film from 1980. The Friday the 13th film from 1980 held up extremely well. This movie, honestly, we were bored. Uh... It does for me. It it does the, all the wrong things f- of a horror film. What a horror film shouldn't do. It depends upon people making the worst possible decision, and because of that, I gotta give it a strong pass. Now, next up, I'll take it over. You're just gonna have to believe me that I'm holding it up now. But I'm holding up right now. Texas Chainsaw Massacre: The Beginning. Now. This, if you liked Arlie Ermey, you're going to get more of him because he's in this one here as well. Now, one of the neat things about Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning is it's got Jordana Brewster. And I'll be honest with you, as an, as an actress and as a likability factor, Jordana Brewster, she's got a stronger likability than, uh, than Jessica Biel does. The problem with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning, is it's set before the Beale film. It's set before that film. So we kind of know how this movie's going to go. We know how it's going to end. Uh, we know that the characters can't make it out. The idea behind the beginning is, is literally, we find it through the film, is that it's to find out how he found his masks. I'm going to try it. Tell you what, guys, if I go out and I come back in again, 